welcome to Watchtower History. We're finally here. We've finally made it. This is the end of a culmination of a series of discussions we've been doing on basically a Rutherford's roadmap to how Watchtower came from where it was to what it is today. We're calling it Rutherford's Roadmap to Enduring Persecution because this idea of enduring persecution is what Rutherford used as the evidence to build the doctrinal framework of this new theology that he was creating during the 1920s and the 1930s. We've looked at how the witnesses stood firm against Hitler and against Nazi assault. We also looked at how they backed down and some of the racism that was involved, as well as some of the things that they were doing with Hitler, the letters, the declarations, and the documentation and evidence behind that. Then we looked at the replacement theology. Why did Rutherford say those things? We looked at a lot of those things uh, in the development of that, the context of those passages. And then we looked at the implications of what happens if you take that too far. So who vindicates Jehovah's name and how everything was applied to Watchtower. Every Old Testament story is a type, an antitype. Every prophecy in the Old and the New Testament, everything centered around Watchtower after 1914, 1918, 1919. And Rutherford as being the one who took the lead at that time. And now we're at the point where we want to know where did Rutherford get these ideas from? And why did he choose the path that he chose? One of the recent pages on JW.org was protect yourself from misinformation. While this is commendable, has the Watchtower done this historically? We've seen in many of our discussions leading up to this, we've seen in other discussions on our channel, that there's so much of the history that they're leaving out, giving a dis different perspective on, or they're completely misrepresenting it. So how do we avoid that? One of those is, Fact check the history. And that's what we're trying to do. And even Watchtower has asked us in, in a recent Watchtower article to do exactly that, to fact check the modern history of Jehovah's Witnesses. In our recent discussions, we've been also showing some of those anti-Semitic racist statements from the Watchtower during the 1920s to the 1940s. So let's talk a little bit about Rutherford's background, Rutherford's history. All right, in Macmillan's Faith on the March, he says, J.F. Rutherford's background was totally different. He was born November 8th, 1869 on a farm in Morgan County, Missouri. He had no youthful life. When he was 16, he decided to be a lawyer. In order to get his father's consent to do this, he had to hire a man to fill his place on his father's farm, as well as pay tuition fees and other expenses of his education, since his father wouldn't help him. A friend gave him a loan with no security other than his word. And this money enabled him to fulfill his schooling. As soon as he was able, he repaid the debt in full. So he received a little encouragement at home. His father was a strict disciplinarian, which deprived young Rutherford of any emotional life. So I'm gathering he was an ambitious man seeking higher education and pursuing a higher education to get the thing where he wanted to in life. Something he discouraged others from doing. <laughs> and, and this point here that says Rutherford was deprived of any emotional life. I think that's very telling for how we see his personality later on in life. All right, the 1975 yearbook talks a little bit also about his family. It says, Rutherford himself was a courageous fighter for the truth. He was born of Baptist parents in Morgan County, Missouri, on November 8, 1869. 
from Sister Ross, the elder natural sister of Joseph Franklin Rutherford, A.D. Schroeder learned this. Their father was a staunch Baptist out in Missouri where the family lived. Her younger brother, Joseph, never could accept the Baptist hellfire teaching. And this resulted in many heated debates in the household, even before they heard of the truth. Her brother always had been one of the strong convictions with a deep sense of justice. From youth, he wanted to be a lawyer and a judge. Here's again that the story of Rutherford was a Baptist. His father was a strict disciplinarian. He wanted to be a lawyer, and he had to kind of make his own way. And so they're trying to set him out. That is, in his younger years, he was on that path. He was on the right path. And this is why he was the one that was best suited to take over after the death of Russell. I think that's where they're going with that. Well, that that would have been their decision. That wasn't Russell's decision, for clarification. Yeah. Again, see Rutherford's coup on that. The book from Red Person. Now, the Watchtower of April 15th, 1894, has a letter from Rutherford. This is the first letter of his that was published. The letter is supplemental evidence for what the 1975 yearbook says. The letter reads, by way of explanation for ordering this amount of books, I desire to say that about two months ago, two young ladies came into my office selling these books. I was very busy when they presented their card and seeing that they were ladies selling books, I bought the three volumes. There are only three books published for the Millennial Dawn set for the date here that Rutherford writes this letter. And you can see in the photograph over there on the left what those three volumes would have looked like. I bought the three books thinking that by doing so, I was helping them out. I have since concluded that these ladies brought me glad tidings of great joy. I took the books home and thought little of them until a few weeks ago. When I had some spare time, I began reading the first volume, and it was so very interesting that I could not stop. The result is, my dear wife and myself have read these books with the keenest interest, and we consider it a godsend and a great blessing that we have had the opportunity of coming into contact with them. And so remember, this is 1894, but we don't see really any further activity from him on this front until about 1904, when Macmillan visits there. And so we'll get into that story and a little bit of the history behind that in just a little bit. Stay tuned. The St. Louis Globe Democrat for September 18th, 1880 has an article here, The Baptists. 61st Annual Meeting of the St. Louis Association at Salem. And if you look here, you'll see the business session. It says the committee reported that the following entitled to seats. And so the Bush Creek Church, we have J.F. Rutherford sitting, standing there. He's, he's, he's in the Baptist Church there. And also in the standing committees, he's in the ministerial education. So in the Baptist Church, he's very schooled in the, in the Baptist theology. So in Rutherford's historical sketch, that's in the St. Paul Enterprise of January 16th, 1917, he mentions that their only child, a son, was born on the 10th day of November, 1892, only a few days after the election of President Cleveland. And being an admirer of the president, the parents named the son Malcolm Cleveland Rutherford. Now, in those early years, Rutherford was very active in the political movement. And we're going to see a little bit of that going forward here. In the 1913 Souvenir Convention Report, there's an article here that says, Why Judge Rutherford Turned from Atheism. And it says, Pastor Russell convinced him that religion is a matter of reason, not sentiment. And they say here that 20 years ago in the state of Missouri, the judge was doing politics in practicing his profession. He was a success. His religious views were those of the Baptist denomination says Rutherford turned from atheism. Well, the story here that he's got is very interesting. It says the worthy judge leaned back in his chair and began to elaborate on how his attention had first been directed to the writings of Pastor Russell and how he had tested and weighed every statement after he read them before making them his own. Then he continued. The final test came when I began to apply the high standards taught in Pastor Russell's books to the pastor himself. I was determined to ascertain if this man, 
whose pen had made it clear the reasonableness of the highest standards I had ever read, was as the scribes and Pharisees of olden time. I was determined to know whether he himself was a doer of what he taught, or he was merely a preacher of it. This investigation was not made hastily. I spent years at it. I applied all kinds of tests. I dug up every record I could find. Some of these records were made by his enemies, and I have never known any great man who had true friends who did not have some enemies. And as I investigated every charge or complaint made by them, they yielded the same testimony when sifted to the bottom. And so he had gone off into agnosticism, into atheism, and he's saying it was Pastor Russell's books that converted him and that it took him years to research it. And that he tried to verify every single fact, every statement made about Russell. It sounds like quite an investigation. But we've seen how Rutherford investigates things. <laughs> and so was he going after primary sources? <laughs> was he checking the context of scriptures? Was he going to the, uh, you know, to the history and verifying it was correct? Well, apparently not because he changed it all later. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a contradictory right there. Yeah. And so before he became a Bible student, while he was a Baptist, he was involved in politics. There's a Time Magazine article in the religion section, and it's called California Cults. This is from the March 31st, 1930 Time Magazine. And the Time Magazine article says, Judge Rutherford was born on a Missouri farm, practiced law at Boonville, acquired a circuit judgeship, continued practice in St. Louis, Kansas City. He accompanied the late William Jennings Bryan on his first presidential campaign tour, announcing him as appointed by God to straighten out the problems of the world. Mr. Bryan's example inspired Judge Rutherford to wear habitually a black bow tie. In 1916, he succeeded Charles Taze Russell. And we'll get more into his stint with William Jennings Bryan a little later on. But it's interesting that Time Magazine makes a very, very big point about this. Bryan was a big influence on Rutherford, enough so that, you know, decades later, he's still dressing like Bryan. Years after Bryan passes away, he's still dressing as like Bryan. He still was very also, heavily inf he's still very heavily influenced by that man. And also something that stands out, uh, Rutherford does believe people can be appointed out, can be appointed by God to straighten out the problems of the world. So he believes God can appoint people to save the world. So that, that's something very interesting. And a note on Time magazine, the the topic of where he was written up in that magazine was as a cult. And you might be asking yourself, why California? Well, this was during the Depression when he was living in a mansion in California. And the article itself points out that he had two fine automobiles, which were Cadillacs, as we've shown in other, other discussion. So the idea here is not a, a, a praising of him or a, 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 a an article uh, of um, a biography on it. It's more they're doing it on cults, mm -hmm. not the man. So that's something interesting. Um, and I couldn't help but notice in the magazine. Now, this was 1930. And here he's doing this interview. And somehow the people in the interview uh, thought that his ideas and that is a lot of it is that the prophets are going to come down and, and live in his mansion, which is why he got it. Uh, but that it's shared by the 1 million members of the international Bible students. Okay. There was not 1 million members in the international Bible students. And my opinion is I don't think the writer of that article invented the number. He probably got how many members do you have? And brother, oh, we've got a million members. Well, wow, that share my idea. 
So he was always, here's another example, and we've made others in the past of him exaggerating, turning facts around, and, and, and switching things around. So this is stepping forward a little bit in time from his background and going to where he got. And now we're going to re, re, regress a little bit and continue on with his story. And what was he doing here? Advertise, advertise, advertise. There's a December 1st, 1916 Watchtower. And there were a couple different versions of this printed. This was the memorial edition after Pastor Russell died. So it was about Pastor Russell's uh, life and, and the funeral and all of that. And then in the second edition, Rutherford added his biography. So this would have been a second edition. This is the biography here. And in this little biography, it says, How the Judge Claimed a Fame. And Rutherford tells a story here. Young Rutherford, however, found a friend who was willing to loan him the necessary money. Remember, he wanted to go to school. He wanted to be a lawyer. Giving only an unsecured personal note. At 16, he was not only carrying his course in school, but he was studying law and shorthand at the same time. 16. Note, note that it says 16. Continuing his law studies while at school, he spent two years under the tutorship of Judge E. L. Edwards, a noted Missouri jurist. At the age of 20, Mr. Rutherford was the official reporter of the courts of the 14th Judicial Circuit of Missouri. At 22, he was admitted to the bar and began the practice of law at Boonville, Missouri. Early in his career, he was taken into the law firm of Draffin and Wright at Boonville, and made the trial lawyer. Mr. Rutherford practiced in all the courts of Missouri for upwards of 15 years, appearing as counsel in the federal circuit courts, as well as in the Supreme Court of the United States. He served for four years as public prosecutor at Boonville, Missouri. At times, he served as special judge in the 8th Judicial Circuit Court of the same state. In 1909, he became a member of the New York State Bar and has since resided in greater New York. All right, so this is how he's outlining his story and, and his history of being involved in the law. So the Morning Union, Grass Valley, California, January 17th, 1917, has an interesting story about Rutherford. And, and the date, of course, January 17th, this is right after he became president of the Watchtower Society. In the story, it says, In order to earn a little money to assist, he stayed out of school one winter to sell books. He had many strenuous experiences tramping through the deep snows from one farmhouse to another. He was almost drowned on one occasion, the ice breaking whilst crossing a creek. After struggling in the ice for hours and until after dark, he reached the shore. Being in a strange country who knew not where to go, but late at night, with his clothing frozen on him, he found a farmhouse and was taken in. It was then and there that he made a resolution that if he ever should make money enough, he would never turn away anyone who was attempting to work his way through school. And we've seen, you know, some of those long winter stories, you know, Little House on the Prairie. But does this sound legitimate to you? Well, in the winter, to fall in water for hours, um, you, you, I, I don't want to make a call that I, I, I can't make not being there, but being from up north, you, the, the, the water will suck the heat out of you, regardless of what you're wearing. Um, hours. Uh, if a half hour, maybe, you know, uh, but for hours, if to be out on the lake, it's sounding like the ice broke mm -hmm. and then took hours to get in. You're, you're in the cold water. I, I, I to me, I don't see that, that how being long, realistic. How long does it take to get frostbite? Mm -hmm. It doesn't take that long if you're. Mm -hmm. If you're in, you know, if the ice broke and there's ice around you, I don't know. I, I, get, get, you could get online. There, there's, there's some program where it tells you if you fall in the Atlantic Ocean and in, in the North Atlantic Ocean, how long it will take. And remember, water 
it, it frozen, it's b below 32. So the water not frozen is at 32 degrees. Stick your hand in a bucket of ice and see how long you could, just your hand, see how long you could keep it there. Now jump your whole body in that and see how long you, you, you'll you last. So I'm, I'm, I'm not leaning toward that being true. Not because it's Rutherford. If, if it was about anyone, I'd probably say the same thing. And this is a little further south. So how much snow do they get? Well, you know, the long winter, the there was more snow in, in the northern hemisphere of the United States at the time. So it's possible. But I don't know. Hours, maybe he meant it felt like it was hours. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I if call... the ice is breaking, one, it's thick enough to walk out on at some point. Yeah. Yeah. So that takes a lot of cold to freeze a lake. Yeah. And if you fall in that, you ask any ice fisherman who's fallen in there. The first thing they're doing is getting out because because that water will it will pull the heat. Remember, not being scientific, but heat goes to cold. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's leaving you and your body's what now at this point, your body is pulling everything in for your core. And then the next phase is you shiver. And then once you stop shivering, you, you, you know, you're done. So not sure about that one. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. After recording this, we found a couple other versions of this story. In the Messenger, the July 19th, 1927 issue from the Toronto Convention, it reads, As a boy, he longed for education. And at 16 years of age, this Missouri boy, even then over six feet tall, braved all winds and weathers selling books among the farmers of his community far and near. On one of these occasions, his weight crushed the thin ice of a stream, and in freezing weather, he was drenched from head to foot, and only escaped pneumonia that night by rising from his bed and resorting to the most extreme exercise to bring about a perspiration. The third version of this story was reported years after Rutherford's death by the Watchtower attorney, Hayden C. Covington. And Covington said in his recording on November 19th, 1978, just some days before he passed away. Uh, he was, uh, <laughs> had been a, in uh, younger life, a book agent <laughs> selling books, you see, and and he was along, uh, going along in Missouri and slipped and fell through the ice. Mm. And uh, he took pneumonia and was about to die. And then he prayed to the Lord that he came out of that life. He would never uh, turn a book agent away, you see. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so, Brother Rutherford had to... I get away from the cold, at, you know, the intense cold in the east in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had one lung, you know, collapsed lung. You know, one lung was collapsed. Right. There was danger of him getting pneumonia because of that experience when he fell in the, you know, in the water near the coast of that. You remember? He said he wouldn't write, uh, you know, he wouldn't uh, run a book agent. <laughs> His office, you see. <clears throat> and also the prison experience. Oh, yeah, yeah his yeah. prison experience up here. So there's some discrepancies between these stories. And we're going to get into these discrepancies into a lot more detail in our discussion following the roadmap when we're going to look at some of the other accusations against Rutherford. But in Rutherford's version of the story, he didn't get pneumonia. Covington suggested that he did and that it was the cause of the collapsed lung and not his prison experience years later. Covington's version is secondhand and that may be suspect because he's recounting the story years later. But on the other hand, Rutherford's varying versions of the story bring about serious questions as well. Is it possible to fall through the ice in winter, remain for hours until dark and then reach the shore? How long does it take to get frostbite just from the air? How could your clothing be frozen 
to you and not get hypothermia? Was he sick when he was in prison? Did he get the collapsed lung from when he was in prison? We have a lot of new information on that as well, recorded by Watchtower at the time it was given. And we're looking very eagerly to share this new information. Stay tuned. It'll be in our next discussion. This one's the Sedalia Democrat, and this is Missouri, December 23rd, 1891. And it lists Mr. J.F. Rutherford, whose home is at Boonville, and who is the official stenographer of the Cole County Circuit. So Mr. Rutherford said that, you know, so here we, we know for sure he was, of course, stenographer. And here's his photo when he was younger. With thicker hair. And yeah, just a little bit. Like all of us. And uh, the Miller County Autogram Sentinel. And this is in November 1st, 1894. says that J.F. Rutherford was one of the speakers at the Democratic rally there. And so if you... If you know anything about politics, the platform that the Democrats were speaking in the late 19th century would be more like the Republicans of today. And the Republicans would be more like the Democrats. It was somewhere in the 20s or 30s, I understand, that uh, there was a shift. And so when we hear Democrat, just think Republican going forward here. So the Kansas City, Missouri, again, let's J.F. Rutherford as Versailles the official court reporter of the first judicial circuit. All right, J.F. Rutherford of Versailles, Missouri, the official court reporter of the first judicial circuit, writes in a letter to the Normal Gazette. As a teacher of shorthand and an expert typist, he, Professor Melton, is surpassed by none. His method of teaching is strictly scientific and practical, and he labors to find young men and women for practical reporters. And so if you look here at this educational one ad, it's also from the same paper. That's at Sloan Deployant School of Shorthand. And so if Rutherford's a teacher and he's saying that in this article here in the legal notice, Rutherford's probably the one who put that notice in the paper. And the Tipton Times here has Rutherford at the circuit court. It says the court appointed J.F. Rutherford as to his qualifications as a stenographer. So that was the Tipton Times. August 31st, 1890. And so he's working his way up. So the Weekly Star in Kansan, June 10th, 1892, also has an advertisement for this. And it has Rutherford's quote about what he said about it. And over here, there's an article from the Sedalia Democrat, July 19th, 1896. It says, Downed Mr. Bell. So this is about Rutherford's involvement in politics. It says, J.F. Rutherford of Boonville was present and address the people on the political topics of the day. He spoke about an hour explaining the financial question and making a splendid appeal for free silver and closed with a beautiful tribute to Brian, Williams, Jenny, and Brian, Bland, and Vest. C.C. Bell, the Apple King of Boonville, took the stand and gave his views on the financial and tariff questions from a McKinley standpoint. He attempted to answer the arguments produced by Mr. Rutherford and probably did so to his own satisfaction. <laughs> when he finished, Rutherford was loudly called for and responded in a few minutes' talk, answering the satisfaction of the loud crowd, all of Bell's arguments, as was evidenced by the shouts of approval. Mr. Rutherford is a candidate for the Democratic nomination for representative of Cooper County, and should he receive the nomination, well, and he will no doubt be elected, as he's a brilliant orator and very popular. And so they're now, saying here that he was a very good speaker. Now, yeah, and th this is interesting. Th this is, to me, was the one that really stood out for, from things. Um, one, he's speaking in politics. He's doing, he's doing it publicly. And if you look at the crowd wanted him back, he knows how to speak. He knows how he's learning how to work a crowd. And that's a literal expression. You, you know, when you ask musicians, actors, and comedians, they're working the crowd. You rile a crowd up. So he's learning how to motivate people with his speaking. And he's, once again, it, it's politically involved, which is important for later. And so here's several clippings again of, of Rutherford as a stenographer. He's 
serving in many cases. There's a case here that he's involved in that's murder in the second degree. Uh, he's involved in the court of common pleas for a specific case. A lot of things here. We're going to come back to this one later, but this is the Miller County autogram for Thursday, October 16th, 1894. And this is, trying to, this is where they're trying to determine if the Democratic and Populist Party should try to combine. And Williams Jennings Bryan was a candidate for the Populist Party. So you'll notice here under the Democratic ticket. In the third column. In the third column, we have the prosecuting attorney here as a Mr. J. F. Rutherford. All right, but we'll come back to this later because we're going to talk about Rutherford and Brian's relationship. We'll have a little bit more on that. Stay tuned. Again, the Miller County autogram for March 14th, 1895 says, a large number of lawyers from abroad will probably be in attendance of, at court next week. And among them, J.F. Rutherford Boonville, USA, who it will be remembered, lifted the burden of Cooper County politics off his shoulders long enough last fall to invade and redeem Miller County. And while the redemption was taking place down here, the enemy captured the county of the Stevens in the home of our friend Rutherford, who has been unhappy ever since. And we might add here that the next time the Democrats import another upstart into this county to vilify her people, they will get him thrashed with an inch of his life, even if he is feeble-minded. Oh, I like those old newspaper stories sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, in a lot of these old newspapers, they would, you know, put all these little clips, you know, you know, Jim Bob Walton was going to see grandma in at town here and spent a couple of days there, you know, and so you'll see all those little things or, you know, uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder, you know, whoever was eating at this restaurant today or stayed at this hotel. So, you know, those were quite quaint times. But this Miller County autogram again, September 19th, 1895, says lawyers J.F. Rutherford at Boonville came in Sunday evening to attend the circuit court. And it says, Mr. Ray is an old practitioner, a good lawyer, and a jolly fellow. Notice I didn't say that about Rutherford. So he was not an emotional fellow, as we saw earlier. The St. Louis Dispatch of July 11th, 1896, has a front page story on Williams Jennings Bryan. And he says, if elected, I shall under no consideration be a candidate for re-election. Right? And if you look there in the last column to the far right, and unfortunately, it's torn off there. But I, I blew up the little snippet that's left. It says speeches were made by J.F. Rutherford. So J.F. Rutherford was one of those speakers that ratified Williams Jennings Bryan as the candidate. Wednesday morning, February 17th, 1897, we have the court record here with Rutherford as judge. Now, there's a question as to, you know, how often did he serve as judge? The claim is that he served as a fill-in judge, I think, four times? Yeah, I heard four. A four is what I heard. But can all four be verified? Uh, I found this one and I think one other one. Uh, I think somebody said they could verify maybe three. I wasn't able to verify that. But they weren't able to find uh, a four. So if anyone has those, uh, that would be helpful. Send it our way. We'd really appreciate it. And the other one here is a case determined in the Court of Appeals of the state of Missouri. And this is an interesting story. All right. Rutherford's involved here. And let's see what kind of person he's described as. 